Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Surface Hardness, Case Depth, Surface Finish. What you can't see does matter. I'm Amanda Harmoning. I'm an admin assistant here at AERA, and I will be moderating today's event with my colleague, Rob Monroe. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development over at AERA. For those of you uh, that have membership, of course, the biggest reason why you've got membership is to have access to us over here at the Technical Services Department. And recently, we just hired Fernando Corello. And Fernando is based out of Argentina. He speaks several languages, including Spanish. So any of our Spanish members that are on today, if you're looking for any kind of Spanish technical information and you want to contact Fernando directly, there's his email address right there. So Fernando at AERA.org and Fernando can help you out. So uh, even those of you too that are using Process Pro, um, keep in mind, we have a lot more information in the tech department than even what you'll see in Process Pro. We can get you things like, uh, you know, fuel injection, diesel uh, specifications, injector specifications, you know, that kind of stuff. We have that stuff on hand. Also keep in mind too that, um, uh, we are open Monday through Friday. We're 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we've got a good coverage throughout the day to, to get you looked after. You can email us, you can fax us, you can phone us, however, whichever you prefer. So take advantage of it. Um, that's why we're there. We'd much rather you see, you know, answer those questions for you in the tech department and have us look up all that information. And you can spend your time on the shop floor making money. That, that's kind of the idea. So we can look after all that stuff for you. Another new announcement that we've got, this is for our members only at this point. So this is kind of one of our member benefits of being a, a part of AERA is we've just started a members only Facebook group page. And uh, so what you'll be able to do is this group page is for members. When you log on, you'll be able to, you know, you can do things like share maybe some shop equipment that you've got for sale, uh, some items that you're selling. The idea though, it's member to member contact and their interaction. So you know, maybe you, you feel comfortable with you're looking for a, a particular part even that, that nobody else has and maybe another member has and you can do that on our Facebook page and do that. So to find us on there, just go to just go to Facebook and then just go and search AERA members and you'll see it there and just go ahead and uh, and uh, log on and there'll be a couple questions that'll come through once you, you know, once you get the invitation, you'll you'll see a couple questions. And we're about 24 hours, we'll get back to you and we'll make sure we'll just, we want to verify that you're a member and then we'll get you part of that page. Another thing that we've got, uh, and this will be my last slide here before we bring on the crew uh, from Elgin, is our ERAF engine giveaway. So this is the Engine Rebuilders Educational Foundation. And what we do is every year we typically build an engine um, and have it as a giveaway and we give it away at PRI. So this year's no different. The tickets are 10 for $20. And that includes free shipping within the continental U.S. So for a $20 ticket, you got a chance to win a, a 540 cubic inch big block Chevy. This thing's loaded with parts. It's got MSD, DART, Holly. Uh, it comes complete. It's got the water pump, the distributor, the carbs. So it's just about turnkey ready to go. And again, all the proceeds from this giveaway go right into the educational like foundation. So uh, it goes right back into training machinists and it goes back into helping industry get educated. So um, great program. We look forward to doing that draw in December over at PRI as well as, uh, and if you want tickets for that, you can do that right on our website as well as if, or you can call Karen, it's totally up to you. So there's the phone number on screen if you wanna give Karen a call and you can go ahead and purchase tickets for that one, so. All right, well enough chit chat for me. Um, what I'll do is I'm gonna bring on Dan Gathman from Elgin. And Dan's got Briar Dykeman and Scott Steyer with them. So any one of these will be able to answer questions for you. Now, Dan, Dan's been at Elgin for a long time. He's been there 47 years and is currently vice president of plant operations. So uh, Dan knows Elgin very, very well. He's been there since, I think he'll tell you, he's been there since he was a teenager. So uh, any questions for Dan, just make sure to put those in that questions box and we'll get those all answered for you at the end. So uh, guys, how are you all doing today? We are great. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's good. <clears throat> so I'll I'll stop talking and I'll just let you guys do your thing. So carry on. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rob and Amanda. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, whichever may apply to whoever's uh, participating today. Uh, appreciate you calling in and 
uh, reviewing this uh, this information. I'm Dan Gathman. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I've been with Elgin Industries. It'll be 48 years in August uh, uh, this year. I, did, I started at uh, 14 years old, um, helping out maintenance after school and you know, as, as a freshman uh, in high school uh, with a work permit for the first two years. And then uh, uh, worked all through high school. Every minute that I wasn't in school, I was working uh, in the shop. I uh, had a desire to, uh, to be an auto mechanic, uh, so we went into a two-year associate's uh, degree program uh, for automotive technology uh, at a local college here. Um, and then when I finished that, I had uh, already been hired uh, basically by Chrysler um, due to Plymouth troubleshooting uh, uh, competitions in high school that we did very well in. Um, Marty uh, Jr., who was Marty Sr., who founded the company's son, uh, approached me and just said, hey, you've you shown some real promise. Uh, how would you like to switch kind of your, uh, uh, your career path here and uh, you know, focus on process improvement in my machine shop? And I will continue to send you to school at night for whatever you want to do. So the, uh, that's worked out very well uh, through the years, uh, picking up uh, additional training uh, at many of the uh, local colleges and mo uh, most of the work at Northern Illinois University. Uh, in the material science and metallurgy uh, side of the equation. So, so I'm going to give you uh, uh, just a brief history of the company uh, to start with, and then we're going to dive into uh, uh, what the title says. We're going to talk about surface hardness case steps, uh, which are heat treat properties, and the surface finish and form, which are shape properties of the products that we uh, that we provide that you guys use. So. History of the company, we were founded in 1919 by uh, Martin Scope Sr. Um, he actually, uh, just like me, started very young uh, rebuilding engines, working on things. Uh, he was like 16 years old, went to work in an automotive shop, found quickly that uh, nobody made good piston pins, so they kept having pin failures. So he decided to uh, pick up an old lathe and, and uh, make pins himself in his garage. Um, uh, he was successful at actually making piston pins and send them out and get the uh, heat treat and the grind done at that time and uh, and, and met that and that sparked a passion uh, in uh, like many entrepreneurs to uh, uh, to follow up on that and, and expand the business. In uh, 1927, uh, he began uh, operating under the name of Elgin Machine Works um, at a very young age. These are just some, you know, nostalgic pictures of how heat treat was back in the early days. These are most likely kind of in the 30s, somewhere here. Yeah. So the, you know, this is what a heat treat shop looked like back then. Uh, a lot of change, like I said. Uh, even since I've been here in '73, um, we've just gone through. You know, our our world changes every couple of days lately. So the uh, what you see in '47 or '48 years of change is. Uh, is dramatic and there's been a lot of improvement to how things are built and uh, the quality levels that are expected by the consumer today. Um, so the, just told, you know, for, your, for older folks that recognize screw machines and the center slappers and stuff like that, these are just, you know, some of the, some of the uh, uh, shots from our company back in the day. Uh, one of the interesting things with Elgin was in, uh, from 1927 to 54, uh, we actually raced in the Indianapolis 500 uh, with the piston pin special uh, car. Uh, Andy Granatelli was a mechanic for the team at, at one time, and uh, you can see that the uh, drivers that we used are listed at the bottom of the slide uh, on the left side there. With the, uh, we finished, I think the best we did was like, uh, was it fourth? Third, yeah, third, fourth, 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 fourth place. Yeah. Fourth, yeah. So uh, when I started here, we still had the race car room, you know, out hey, over at the garage, and there was still these, you know, wheels and magnetos and stuff in there. So as a as a young young man, and that was just uh, fin just really neat, you know. So the this is where we are today. We have a very modern uh, 150,000 square foot uh, facility, um, great canvas uh, campus, excuse me, and uh, uh, we are tier one uh, to the, uh, the the big three and to large engine uh, rebuilders. Um, our customers are, you know, as you can see, Chrysler, Ford, General Motors, Harley, John Deere, Navistar, Polaris. Um, our primary product that we build is uh, valve push rods. Uh, we supply the Hemi engine, we supply the 6.7 uh, power stroke engine, um, and then a myriad of other components to, uh, to that same customer base, uh, internal engine and chassis. Um, 
some of our accolades. Uh, we were awarded best in the world from the Chihuahua engine plant in Ford in 2017 and 2019. That just means that you're in the top 100 suppliers for Ford uh, for Mexico. Um, we've been a John Deere achieving excellent partner level uh, coming up. This will be our 10th year this year. We're very proud of that. It's very hard to uh, maintain. Um, and then we were actually supplier of the year for Deere uh, with their push rods and piston pins uh, in 2017. Uh, for a company our size, that's uh, we were uh, picked from a from a uh, an audience of 4,000 vendors, so we were really proud of that. So, and then we are platinum for GM and Blue Diamond for Navistar. We've uh, those are some of the accolades that we've had in the past, and then uh, with Jasper, uh, a partner, uh, pretty much every year. Quality certs probably recognize these to, to supply that as a tier one. You have to be IATF 6949 and ISO, and uh, have the uh, environmental ISO. Uh, we are Q1 compliant, uh, certified, excuse me, and we're compliant to the uh, heat treat requirements within uh, CQI 9 and the welding requirements within CQI 15 that apply to our push rods. We currently build about 600,000 push rods a week, uh, you know, up and down 20 or 30,000 a week. So we are a substantial supplier in, in the high volume uh, OEM tier one supply chain. One thing that's unique about Elgin uh, is that we are vertically integrated. Uh, so we have the machining all the way from the raw material coming in to sending out the finished part. So a lot of shops can't say that they you know, have a captive heat treat shop or captive grinding or, or even some of the advanced machining. So we're very proud that uh, we can keep that all under one roof. And that allows us to maintain a competitive edge with uh, uh, some of the international suppliers that we uh, butt, a heads up, uh, butt up against uh, in, our, in our business. So today, um, that's a little bit of the history of the company. Uh, we're going to jump in now the, to the, the meat and potatoes here. So uh, case hardening is um, a heat treatment, obviously. Uh, there's also neutral hardening, and that's a heat treatment. Uh, today, we're going to focus on what you would most likely see in engine rebuilding in the valve train and in the reciprocating assembly, um, which are uh, a combination of the two, but they're mostly case hardened parts. And some people may say, well, I've heard case hardening, I understand, you know, I, I think I, don't, I know what that is, but what does that mean? You know, so the um, case hardening, it, the definition is to, I, I use the analogy like an M&M, &M. uh, an M&M has got a soft core of chocolate and then a very hard candy shell around the outside. So when you case harden a steel part, you are looking to maintain those types of properties. You want a core that is most as tough and strong and softer in nature. And then you want a very hard surface uh, all around that uh, part for to uh, su sustain your, uh, your wear. Uh, you say, well, why is the core gotta be soft or ductile? It's because engines are built to run longer, right? So the, uh, if you have uh, uh, a solid uh, heat treated part that is hardened all the way through, um, it will be very strong for very short periods of time. Uh, everybody wants an engine now today in, in the diesel industry, we're looking at you know, upwards of 10,000 hours of service. So they, uh, you wanna have a, a, a part that can go through multiple cycles of flexing and stressing and not fail in fatigue. So, so you can generate case hardened parts in a number of different ways. At Elgin, we use carburizing and we use carbon nitriding and we use induction. So I'm gonna take a little time and kind of uh, go through each of those uh, processes to just give you a little background of what that means. Carburizing is used in piston pins, camshafts, uh, some king pins. It's used in uh, push rod ends. It's pretty much used wherever you want a case and you have the luxury of finishing that surface after heat treat. So cams, you know, obviously the, they're carburized um, and hardened and then they're ground. Uh, uh, so carburizing is used for typically deeper uh, case steps. Camshafts, uh, uh, you know, you need 80 to 100 thousandths case steps minimum on those lobes so that they, uh, so they last a long time uh, riding against the lifter. Um, some of the uh, other parts that are carburized would be like a, a piston pin. So like I explained, they need the ductility because piston pins are constantly being squashed. You know, they're going every cycle that pin flexes. Uh, so if it was a solid hard, hardened part, it would just shatter uh, or it would be very brittle and, or at any defect in the uh, uh, anomaly in the, in, in the metallurgy of the steel or on the surface, 
uh, it will start to form a fatigue failure. And that might take two, three years to fail, but it will. You know, So when you make it out with a duct of core and put a hard, hard coating around it, uh, the M&M analogy, um, you get a part that will, that will perform in service for thousands and thousands of hours. So this picture is just a cross section, um, excuse me, a longitudinal section through a uh, little bit bigger than an automotive size piston pin. This is probably a diesel piston pin of the smaller, like an eight, nine liter range. Um, so this is cut in half long ways, um, and then it's polished down and etched with nitric acid and alcohol to uh, reveal the case. And you see this, uh, the case goes on all surfaces that are exposed to the carburizing atmosphere. The carburizing is done by putting you know, steel into a furnace, heating it up above 1450 degrees, and then when it's up in that high temperature range, usually between 1450 and 1800, you introduce a hydrocarbon atmosphere and that steel will take on more carbon and that carbon starts to deposit and uh, you know, diffuse into the structure of the steel, uh, but it does cover every surface that is exposed. And you say, well, okay, why is that important? Well, on camshafts, if you don't want certain surfaces hardened, maybe the distributor gear, uh, you don't want them really brittle uh, or the journals between the, uh, uh, the bearings and the lobes so that you could still have a tough ductile cam that you could bump straighten, uh, but yet you have good wear surface, you might want to block that carburizing. So the camshafts a lot of times are copper plated and then they grind off the surface, so they grind the copper off the surfaces that they want the carburizing to be on. So then that, uh, those surfaces will uh, be carburized when it goes through the furnace, but the ones that still have the copper on there, they don't because it blocks it. So uh, just a, a point of interest. Um, another picture of a carburized part, and again, remember I said uh, if, it, if it's carburized, it usually has post heat treat machining or grinding, uh, like that camera, like a piston pin. Um, this is a one-piece push rod where this tube uh, has this profile machined onto it. Um, so we could show you how you can uh, actually analyze what's on that part. We cross-section through the tube, and we take the little piece that's left, and we section that longitudinally. We mount that into a piece of phenolic plastic called Bakelite. Um, it's a hot press that mounts that to hold that. And then we polish this surface very finely, uh, you know, down to a one micron finish. So it's like a mirror. Um, and then once that's polished, then you can etch it with acid and you can now see at a metallurgical level uh, what the uh, microstructure looks like. You can measure, you know, the thickness of the case and things like that. Uh, this one, you can see the, the carburized case follows the OD of the tube. Uh, follows the undercut around your rocker clearance, uh, around the ball, and then is also on the inside of the tube. One of the other processes that we do, which is a um, kind of a combination process, is car called, called carbonitriding. Most of you have heard of nitriding, which is like put on valves, uh, stems, and stuff to give you advanced wear uh, properties. Valves are already made out of very good uh, materials that are heat treated and or they're stainless. Um, the nitriding that's on a valve is a very, very thin, very long uh, process to, to develop uh, or to uh, apply and it's, and it's very thin. It's less than a thousand thick. So in the valve train parts other than the valve stem, like your rockers and, and uh, push rod, push rod ends, uh, your pivots, um, those are all going to either be carburized or carbon nitrided. Carbon nitriding is the combination of taking the carburizing process and then we, uh, there's an ammonia atmosphere that's added into the hydrocarbon and it, it forms nitrides into the structure, which raise the hardness even higher than what you could get steel naturally hardened. Most steels, if they're heat treatable, uh, you can harden up to Rockwell C6566. A carbon nitrided surface has a Rockwell C equivalence of 68 uh, and uh, is uh, the, the uh, I guess the con of having a, nit a carbon nitrided case versus a carburized case is carbon nitriding is very, very thin uh, relatively. So on a push rod tube, uh, it, it, uh, it is going to have to be put on a part, the, that process is used on parts where you're not removing any stock. You're not going to grind any stock after you, after you do it. So, so I've got kind of a, because that was a little long-winded, apologize for that. The uh, it's kind of a 
you know, put it in practice and something that you recognize. If you take a push rod, that we, this is the Hemi push rod, and we section it longitudinally and then we mount it in bake light and now we etch it uh, after it's been polished. The case that's on the tube is a carbon nitrided case because the tube is finished but it comes right out of heat treat. All it does is go through rotary straightening and then it's finished and it's, you know, it goes through processing where they end the ground and balls are welded on the ends. The ball, um, uh, to contrast that, is a carburized structure because it's going to be ground after heat treat because you can't make a ball perfect enough um, through cold forming uh, to go right into service. So it has to be, uh, you know, going, goes through just uh, like any other grinding process where you got rough and finished grinding. So, and you can see here the case depth on the ball, much deeper. Here, the, this little white area in the center is the soft part that's still left. So there's 80 thousandths of depth of carburizing on a ball, but there's really a light carbon nitrided layer on the tube. The actual surface hardness though is harder on the tube than it is on the ball. Um, and you, you, know, you guys have experience in engine rebuilding and things like that. We'll, we'll see that the uh, very seldom the tube may be rubbing against the guide and it's wiping the guides out because the guides are stamped steel and they're hardened, they're neutral hardened and the bush rod carbon nitriding has actually got a, a higher hardness value. So it'll actually uh, be the non-sacrificial member of that joint. So, the, so now if we take that mount and we look at it under a microscope after it's been polished uh, to a mirror and etch, this is the tube. And this again is taking that, uh, uh, this longitudinal cut right here and magnifying it at uh, 50X. Um, we can see the case depth is very pronounced um, and it consists of uh, right here about 10 thousandths of uh, depth. And then the transition band here is the part that is total case, but it's not hardened case. So there, um, there is uh, uh, what they call effective case and there's total case, kind of like cams have a advertised duration and effective duration. The one that really does the work and what you really need to know when you set those up is the effective duration. So the, uh, cause it is uh, when there's really a flow starting through either the intake or the exhaust valve. Um, for a heat treated part that's going to ride against something, uh, the designers uh, will always spec out the effective case steps, which is typically measured to Rockwell C50. They want to know where Rockwell C50 occurs on the part. And for a spec on a push ride like this, they want it between five and 12 thousandths deep to be Rockwell C50. So you can see here, this one is about 10, and but we actually have probably 18, 19, excuse me, probably 14, 15 thousandths of total case. Uh, added to this. Here's the base microstructure of the low carbon steel tube. This is just the ID of the tube. Uh, so you can see the surface is much rougher on the ID of the tube because it's a welded uh, tube construction and the, the outside is the finished cold, cold rolled uh, uh, from the tube mill. Contrasting that, going back again to our, our picture here, you know, the ball's got the deeper case on it, which is carburized. The structure for the ball will look like this. And you can see the case is a very, the mic truck is very consistent, similar all the way into about 80,000 steep. Um, and then it starts to go to the core material. So the, uh, you get to the softer material, you gotta wear through all this uh, uh, material first. So push rod ball will wear for a very long time uh, against a rock arm, but it, that not necessarily means it'll keep its shape. And I'm, uh, we'll talk about that a little later. <laughs> so, but they are heat treated to uh, not be you know, worn out in, in, in uh, low amount of cycles. Again, just some uh, illustrations to look at how a case looks on different types of parts. Uh, this is the uh, power stroke cup uh, out of the Ford engine uh, cross section. So, we, you know, it's, uh, before it was welded onto the tube uh, in our metallurgy lab, we have to check the, the uh, quality of the heat treatment uh, batch. So the uh, ends are sectioned in half, then mounted, polished. And we go in and we measure the depth of that case um, you also measure the hardness uh, and uh, the uniformity of how good it is all around the profile of that part. Here's a cross section through a rocker arm, which everybody has seen a stamp steel bucket type rocker arm, small black, big black Chevy. Um, these, uh, this is a, car, a cross section through the push rod seat. Now, a lot of, if you've ever run a race engine or been a backyard mechanic that tries to 
uh, erase the engine. It wasn't designed to do that. Uh, you're going to punch through your stamp steel rock arms usually once you go too high a spring pressure, too high RPM. This is where it'll fail. Um, so uh, if these were hardened all the way through, they would fail uh, in 10% of the time that it takes to, to fail apart. Uh, that's designed to wear for a long time and not, not punch through. So it has the uh, carbon nitride case, again, because we're not machining or grinding any of the surfaces on a rock arm after it's been heat treated. So you do have the advantage of the super high hard, uh, very shallow case depth. Cam journal, um, you can see the case is very obvious here when it's been polished and, and etched. This is how, how it looks. Uh, this is the back side, you know, so the base circle side um, of a fairly large cam. Um, this is generated with induction hardening, and I'm going to explain that a little bit because that's another method of providing a case hardened uh, heat treatment uh, on parts. Um, piston pin is an automotive size piston pin, so you can see uh, similar uh, to the larger piston pin section in the previous slide. Um, this shows the, uh, the etchant uh, developing kind of like a, a picture develops. Uh, to show you the uh, where the, the depth of the OD and the ID case go around. This is cut cross-sectionally though through the part instead of the long way. So, so induction hard, you may say, oh, okay, I've heard that word. What's induction? What does that mean? Um, as we talked about, as I talked about heat treating, uh, you know, adding carbon to the steel and doing carburizing and carbon nitriding, where you have to put it into a batch furnace or a continuous furnace, you have to heat it up to this elevated temperature using a gas burner or electric heating elements, and then you add the hydrocarbon so the steel picks up that uh, uh, those properties. In induction, you're starting with a material that is heat treatable uh, right as a bar. You know, so you're going to start with a medium or a higher carbon or alloy steel, um, like camshafts. Most of those that are induction hard are made out of 1060, so they've got a 0.6% carbon content, which is hardenable to Rockwell C60 using induction. Induction doesn't need a furnace, a batch furnace, to, to, to get the part hot. It uses an inducting, induction coil that's hooked to a power generator. And everybody knows, uh, you know, pretty much has heard their house currents uh, or voltage is 120, 60 cycle uh, uh, supply. That 60 cycle means the, uh, the uh, current, the alternating current, AC is changing direction and polarity uh, in the sine wave 60 times a second. Induction works because they take that 60 cycle power coming in and they bump it way up to uh, up as much as 400,000 cycles a second. So it'll change direction uh, that fast. This, uh, uh, what this does is it creates a magnetic field when you wrap a wire in a coil and you run that kind of uh, current through there, changing that fast, that magnetic field is also changing from plus to minus at 400,000 times a second. Um, what that does is that the magnetic properties of steel will actually heat from the inside out. So induction will actually make that steel heat up just from being exposed near that induction. You, you can actually touch this coil uh, when it's doing its job and not burn yourself. But if you get on the other, you know, the, the bolt, as you can see, is cold here. It's at ambient temperature, 70 degrees, and it's at 1,750 degrees right below that coil. So the way induction works, it's feeding this shaft through the coil, heating it, and quenching it with this big quench ring as it exits out the bottom. So you, you can scan and harden a, a part that's made out of a hardenable steel by just running it through a coil one time. So it's, it, it's a very common process used in camshaft manufacturing and also in you know, uh, kingpin manufacturing or typically any shaft work that uh, you want to be able to harden certain parts of a, of a shaft but not the whole thing. This is just a, a little sales you know, or, uh, comparing uh, the Elgin uh, capabilities to harden a shaft very uniformly. Um, one thing that we, uh, we pride ourselves on is our induction is microprocessor controlled. It can stop uh, and slow down the, the part and speed up uh, the rotation so that when we go across an anomaly, like a, you know, I used a ground flat on a shaft, because normally if you induction harden this, you get what you see here from our competition. Uh, you have no penetration in the, in the ground surface uh, up into the hardenable material. Um, you have to have a CNC controlled induction machine to be able to change the speed 
and let that have time to to penetrate in there because uh, as i told you it's heating from the itself out so the closer the surface of that part is to the coil uh, the faster it will heat as soon as you have an anomaly that's away from the coil it doesn't want to build heat there so that's uh, that's the reason that you have to have uh, control over the uh, the speed and the rotation uh, of that device Additional heat treatments that you, I'm sure you've heard talked about. And again, we, we touched a little bit on neutral hardening. That's if you're um, if you're going to harden a, a steel that is direct hardenable, you know, high speed steels, tool steels, things like that. Um, those are just heated up in a furnace and quenched and tempered. Um, you, you know, induction hardening is a form of neutral hardening, uh, but it's still a case hardening par process because it's only neutral hardening the, the first hundred and fifty thousandths of the outside of the of the product so the tempering all that does is uh that's basically like taking the stress out of uh, a heat treat apart when you heat treat apart and it comes right out of the furnace uh, any place there's an anomaly a shoulder a imperfection a corner a radius uh, there's a concentration of stress that the part is trying to uh, basically fail it's trying to break itself apart so tempering relieves those stresses um, and, you, and so tempering is done typically on on uh, uh, cyclic parts like king pins, piston pins, um, the uh, cams, anything where uh, it's going to see a lot of cycles up and down in service. Uh, tempering is done at low temperature, so it's between three and 400 degrees F usually. Um, annealing, uh, that's part of the making the steel in the first place and keeping it soft so you can machine it. Or if you have a heat treated piece of steel, something that uh, and you wanna change the shape or form of it and it's too hard to cut, or uh, you can actually run it through an annealing cycle and make it soft again, do your machining and then re-harden it again. So the uh, heat treat, it's kind of a fascinating uh, science uh, uh, hovering around, uh, you know, of course our, our expertise is all in ferrous metallurgy. So um, iron, steel, anything that has uh, uh, iron in it. The other thing that Elger brings to the table, we have uh, cryogenic treatment. Um, some people call that a heat treatment, but really it's a cold treatment. Um, so we have the ability to take um, engine parts and then subject them after they've been heat treated uh, to a freezer that has a capability of going down to minus 300 F. Uh, so it uses liquid nitrogen to do that. Um, and, the, and you say, well, why would you do that? Um, well, they have metallurgically, the uh, heat treat process is never fully completed on any steel uh, at room temperature. Um, so when when you harden steel, uh, heat it up in a furnace and then quench it in oil, you're typically getting it down to 140 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That, that microstructure that's formed is not totally transformed. They found a number of years ago, and then, you know, cryogenics have been out there now probably close to 20 years. Um, but they found that if they subject those same parts to a deep freeze, it will continue to transform and fully uh, transform and be just more ho homogeneous. Uh, you know, the microstructure is uh, more consistent, more uh, repetitive. Um, that's important if you want the part to stay the exact same size uh, when you made it as when you run it in your engine. So the uh, uh, there are certain uh, high-end uh, engine components that uh, are required to go through the uh, cryogenic treatment and then uh, be reheated up and measured at close to engine temperature so they don't change size. Because so, microstructure, when it changes in, a, in steel, does change the physical size of the, of the part. So the next topic we're going to jump to is uh, the form and finish. So we're going to use the uh, the product that our company was founded on, piston pins. Um, back in this is probably a picture from the 30s or so. <laughs> it was uh, just before the 40 war. before the war. Yeah, uh, polished like I, I know the screw machines. I don't no, 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 mention I worked here forever, but I, I spent uh, nine months uh, in every department when I when Marty first talked me into. Uh, uh, changing my career path, he said, "I'm going to put you for nine months to run every on every machine I have." You know, so I, I spent that first uh, about seven years uh, really knowing how things are made and, and identifying 
uh, what could be changed and things like that. So the uh, um, and uh, the screw machines that we that I were, were on were actually uh, had war tags on them. So they were war. Uh, you know, we had been contracted to make tank track pins uh, for the uh, for the uh, service. Um, so we were, that was part of how they funded getting those screw machines. So the, just another piston, uh, picture of a lapper. Because now we're going to be talking about form and finish. Okay, so today's uh, equipment that's required to generate the surface of a, of a wrist pin uh, consists of grinding and super finishing. Um, the, the grinding process is a start to finish one pass through. Uh, so once that pin has been machined fully and then it's heat treated, carburized so we add that you know nice candy coating to it and then pretty deep um, then we run it through a series of grinding processes that are called centerless grinders um, you machine shop guys uh, you know everybody's worked on a lathe two axis lathe with a center post a post grinder on two post grinder on it that's grinding between centers or chuck grinding on center centerless is a a highly specialized piece of equipment that the pin has a the ability to float and seek its own center because it's only it's held between three points of contact between a grinding wheel, a feed wheel, and a, a work blade, and the third uh, point of contact, but allows the pin to round itself up. And that's uh, we'll see in a minute why that is so important uh, in today's uh, uh, technological understanding of what it takes to make parts last. So this picture of our grinding line uh, also shows our super finisher at the end of grinding if the pin requires it. Um, it goes through a honing process uh, where stones of different grits are rubbed at high oscillation speed um, across the OD of the part while it's rotated and it creates a crosshatch pattern and I'm sure you've seen that um, similar to what you try to do in a cylinder sleeve when you resleeve a, a block or you're even reworking the block that's not uh, wet sleeve um, you're, you hone it with a, a you know fairly coarse hone to get your your valleys nice and deep, and then you go into the fine hone and cut off those peaks to give you a decent uh, breaking surface for your rings, um, and to transfer that heat, you know, out of the uh, combustion uh, event. So uh, this super finishing provides that same type of a hone pattern uh, for wrist pins and uh, shafts that require that. Just getting a couple more pics of how the centerless lapper looks as the pin comes out um, and then what the guts of the inside of the home look like. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the stones are mounted on these uh, devices that are uh, oscillating at, I think it was at 2000 hertz or something like that. So shaking at very fast, not fast as induction, but 2000 times a second. <laughs> so the, um, the, uh, uh, the stones are then pushed down with the air pressure and there's a, a cooling uh, oil that uh, lubricates that as it's going through that process. So we're going to we're going to come back to surface finish which is really what the super finishing is is uh, is helping with and we're going to talk about form uh, first. Uh, form is actually the uh, uh, the lobing uh, or the roundness that uh, is uh, uh, the property of the cylinder of the piston pin, uh, which is 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 critical. Um, you measure that by with advanced equipment now. And here's a picture of a profilometer, which Lake Speed did a you know nice really hour and a half uh, presentation. That anything you ever want to know about a profilometer, just watch that. So then, uh, uh, but on a form scan uh, where it's made to measure the shape of that part. Um, you mount it basically on an inverted chuck, and then this uh, stylus uh, traverses around the part, the part spins around it, and it moves up and down, and actually draws the shape of the part. You may say, wow, that looks like crap. That looks like a funnel, you know? So the, but the the resolution of these facets are in the millions. So I'll show you uh, how technological that they've gotten in defining what kind of shape they want on a pin. So here's a typical uh, 68 millimeter diesel pin um, where you, you would look at magnified very many times. This is the shape of that pin run through the form scan. You say, wow, that's not round at all. But here's the resolution. You got 0.2 microns. So every one of these 
uh, graduation is eight millionths of an inch. Okay, so this this pin, as you can see, has multiple patterns of lobes, and those are uh, those are measured in undulations per revolution. So they, uh, if you're if you're an old time machinist, you're going to grab your mic and mic something two or three times as you turn it. Uh, and say, yeah, it's round or it's not round. You're really looking if it's an oval or is it round. I'm getting the same reading. Um, when you center grind something at a precision level, you're cr creating these harmonic patterns that are beat into the part as part of the grinding. Um, and each one of those has a amplitude signature. So the uh, the bump here, bump here, bump here, bump here, those would be called lobes. So if you ever hear somebody say, how round is it? They're going to say, well, I got a five lobed part or I got a three lobed part. Um, the uh, the engine designers today at the tier one uh, customers that Elgin have, they define all the way out to 40 uh, undulations per revolution. So 40 lobe uh, conditions, they want to know the amplitude of how high that little bump is. So we have to run that through, a, again, this is a very advanced piece of equipment. And here's the blue line is their tolerance. And then the graph is the results. So kind of just to simplify it, if I look over here at three, that is what's the amplitude of the three lobe pattern. It's gonna be that lobe, that lobe, and that lobe, because those are the highest three points. And it's measuring the amplitude of that to the center of the part. Um, they don't care as much about the, the small lobes as they do the big lobes because they, uh, they want that part to be sitting on multiple large sections of metal you know, in roundness. So uh, the science behind this uh, take me two or three hours to go through all the detail or Briar. Briar is our expert on this kind of stuff. So he's uh, sitting in today and uh, we'll be here to answer any questions uh, in more detail. Um, again, I got uh, one of those guys has enough knowledge to be dangerous, but <laughs> can express what, you know, what we do here at Elton. So. Moving on to surface finish, uh, the profilometer uh, is, is uh, similar. It's just a stylus that's tracked across a surface that you want to measure how rough it is. Um, and then uh, the result of that is printed out graphically. Um, you've all worked with in the past, you would have been working with RMS, root mean square um, of the surface if you're a machinist, uh, engine rebuilder. Uh, that's evolved to RA, which is used in the United States, and RZ, which is European. Um, there is no direct relationship mathematically between RA and RZ. You know, we get that asked all the time. Well, what? It's RA6. What is it RZ? There is no direct relationship. You have to actually perform uh, the measurement with the RZ criteria being applied to get that value. Uh, two additional... Um, and again, there's 40 of these, but two additional, I'm going to just talk about a little bit today because they're really specific to, um, you know, to wrist pin performance and cylinder wall. Uh, Lake Speed will fill you in with a lot of good information on valley volume and what RBK and RPK are and things like that uh, as he goes through in that profilometer. Um, so RPK uh, is the measurement of the, uh, the highest peak uh, from the center line of the data. So again, I don't know if you can read, you probably can't, but these, this whole uh, scan right here uh, represents five 31 thousandths increments. So these are cutoffs when you set your profilometer. So it's actually looking at a little over an eighth of an inch length of, of travel. And that's the pattern that that stylus is picking up. That pen looks smooth as glass when you touch it, but you know this is what, the, what it really looks like uh, when you evaluate it. So RA, it is a kind of a global surface finish uh, designation and it, it applies to that whole data analyzed for the average roughness. Uh, RPK is only looking at how high are these peaks from the center of that average number. And then RVK is how low are the valleys? And you say, well, okay, well, why is that important? Um, valley volume, and this is a big thing that oil guys are working on now and both uh, uh, in cylinder and ring development and piston pin development, they're primarily looking at if they have enough valley volume to hold enough oil in the joint uh, to survive those little events uh, where everything's not just perfect in an engine. So they're not just looking at the finish anymore as a an RA, 
Uh, they're looking at what makes up that absolute surface and how much oil can be retained. Uh, they still don't want you know, a, lot, a lot of high peaks or few of them because those will wear uh, down and become you know, part of the break-in, which everybody knows that's about a you know, newer car, newer engine. There's no break-in period anymore. You know, back, when I, <laughs> back when I bought my first uh, engine, so like I would, you know, there was a, a 500, 1,000 mile period of time where you just didn't need, you didn't even, you didn't leave it at any set RPM because you had to go through all these break-ins uh, with everything, so. Centerless grinding, uh, just to touch on that, will generate without super finishing, typically a five to six RA, and this again are the uh, tier one requirements, so that's what the processes are designed around today. So if you have other products that you know what they measure, you can re relate it to that. Super finishing is when you're under two. If you need under two RA, you're going to have to go to a super finish um, type process. Super finish competes today with uh, DLC, diamond-like coating, if you've heard that. Um, a lot of the uh, high horsepower, so engines over 30 uh, liters are going to be all DLC coated. Um, the automotive guys are playing around with that a little bit on even uh, the smaller diameters um, to give them a super hard impervious coating, uh, like a diamond, um, that they don't ever have to worry about. The problem is it's very expensive. So even the... Uh, you know, the, the tier one diesel engines that we supply up to 18 liters, uh, they like to stay away from DLC unless they absolutely need it and have to pay for it. So super finishing will get you um, uh, the science to uh, combat the need for a more expensive process. Um, DLC also, uh, just to, to point out, it will normally measure uh, rougher uh, than uh, then the surface underneath it, it usually increases it up to close to an 8RA, uh, no matter what surface finish you have. So that was kind of the, you know, the, the mini uh, educational part of this presentation. Um, again, our, our metallurgy and lab inspection consists of uh, this equipment. Uh, we have micro hardness, surface hardness uh, around this that we just talked through. Uh, we do also have failure analysis and uh, a master lab to, you know, when we're holding, you know, we're grinding uh, journals and we're holding, you know, plus or minus 50 million statistically, uh, you have to have very good measuring equipment. So that a measuring equipment has to be in an environmentally controlled lab uh, for humidity and, and temperature. Uh, so we have a resolution down to 5 million. And then again, these are pictures that are uh, saw as part of the form scan uh, the profilometer. Uh, we didn't talk about micro hardness testing, but when you when we were talking about case depth, uh, cases are spec'd out to be a certain depth and to be a certain effective case. Like I said, they, they want a hardness of 50 at a certain depth. You say, well, how the hell do you know that? Because if, if I throw it on my Rockwell C tester, I'm just seeing what that surface is at. Or if I'm you know on a lighter scale, because it's a thin case, I don't want to punch through it. I don't know how much of that case I've got. So a micro hardness tester is a lab piece of equipment that takes that mount that we had made and sectioned, cross-sectioned. Um, so if you remember, we had that etched mount of a couple of different carburized uh, or case hardened parts. Uh, it looks at that, you know, we mount that underneath a, a microscope and then there's a little hardness in there, just like on a Rockwell tester. Uh, and the machine will automatically measure uh, the hardness of that case at the surface and it'll work its way in towards the core and we can tell it to take a hardness reading every one thousandth of an inch and that's why it's called micro hardness um, and then the computer that's hooked up to it will illustrate um, what that uh, what that hardness band is and where we where did that where did it find Rockwell C50 and it's all automated so the operator basically gets it in there uh, finds the surface of the part and says go uh, it tells it that I'm expecting the case to be this deep and it will automatically jump about halfway there and see if it's uh, still harder than that because it knows I didn't go past it. So a lot of intelligence in the lab equipment that, uh, uh, that now supports the processes that uh, our, uh, all the engine uh, developers and designers have come up with to, to make engines last uh, as much as they do today. So inverted microscope is used for studying the microstructure. And then we have coordinate measuring machine for uh, doing other uh, evaluation of, of parts. 
Um, next section, and this will be the last section, um, is to talk a little bit about failure analysis and what we see at Elgin. Obviously, um, because we are uniquely uh, positioned, we supply you know, not only the real high volume, 600,000 push rods a week type uh, customers, but we supply the mom and pop shop that might buy five, you know, or one. Um, and we uh, uh, we get the uh, the highest engineering developed uh, requirements uh, of all that customer base, yet we can't share it with any of uh, uh, across those customers uh, due to you know, non-disclosure agreements, but we have that knowledge to help us develop our processes uh, to meet a myriad of uh, different approaches uh, for the for the different things. So, so we do have a, 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 an intense failure analysis capability here. Uh, we see coming in from the uh, you know from engine rebuilders and uh, uh, folks out in the in the field that may say, well, uh, this still looks good. I'm going to reuse it. You know and and, and this is just to uh, kind of put to bed some of the things that you need to keep in, in mind, take into consideration uh, if you're trying to reclaim uh, product. Um, again, these are the, uh, uh, Scott put together the, you know, the five major uh, uh, attributions of, uh, of failure that we see in, uh, in our parts. Example of that would be a one piece push rod um, that's uh, chromoly and carbur carburized and you know hard turned um, 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 some failures we'll see they're just excessively worn now you can actually see that with an naked eye so that's a no-brainer you can see this where it's been overloaded and just mushroom that's a no-brainer um, and then here's a cross section showing where the material has actually been broken away and then redeposited into the microstructure so we sectioned you know across here uh, cut this in half long ways mounted it and then we polish it and etch it and so now we can look at the actual microstructure or what that looks like right there. Here's how it's supposed to look. Um, and then here's the microstructure, how it's supposed to look on the opposite end of the part and here's in the failed uh, area. So uh, new versus reclaimed parts, um, things that are just, you know, uh, food for thought. Uh, when you look at a new cup end of, of a, a push rod, a lifter C, uh, you might place that a cup's used as a as a joint. Um, you might see some wear. If you see wear where uh, there's positive material protruding, like here it's protruding out of the bottom of the cup, uh, up into where the oil hole was in the push rod, uh, that's a big red flag. You don't you would never want to try to reuse anything like that. And this compared to how it should look new. This one's always an eye opener because uh, this push rod, if I hand it to you. Um, and you look at it, it's very polished on the end, the radius looks decent, it feels good, you say, yep, falls right back in the end, it looks great, but if you hold that up to a shape, um, this was built to be a 5 30 seconds radius like this, uh, this is the uh, welded ball equivalent to this uh, one piece, you can see how much of it's worn away already. So even though you might have heat treated material left that would survive, you're going to concentrate all your wear on these outside edges and what happens when you do that in a rocker seat you burn through the rocker and it punches the seat out like we saw in that first picture so the... another thing uh, looking at rockers um, again this is just taking to a new rocker and one that's out of a, an used engine and looking down into the pivot and you can see that there's some indication of wear here when you actually when we take and section through that which we did here uh, you can see the you know the surface that the pivot rides on here is, is brand new and normal and here you can see that ah, there's somewhere but man do I not look like a whole lot of wear well when we mount that and we polish that and etch it we can see that the surface here so here's the cross section under a 50x microscope etched and you can see the nice heat treated case and here it's probably 20 thousandths deep we got about 10 thousandths case depth of carbon nitride it's super hard surface coming along it's right here I take that exact same rocker that's been in an engine already, and I don't know how many miles, you know, maybe this was 100,000 miles, but maybe it was 20. It all depends on the conditions that it saw. And I look at that the same way, here's my profile. So I've got that same depth of, of total case, but now the, the super hard nitrided, carbon, excuse me, carbon nitrided 10,000 layer is already gone where the wear occurs right here. And all you got left is a very mixed metallurgy of not, Totally soft core material, but it's not hard either. So the uh, uh, this this would fail very quickly going back into service, uh, even matched with a brand new pivot. Uh, 
or even matched with the pivot that it was riding against. So the um, need to look at everything. And again, guys that uh, you know are thorough will measure thicknesses and things like that, and, and then we actually try to determine how much of that case is still left or how much of the uh, surface is still left. Uh, the slide here uh, on the opposite side of the equation would be on your on your contact pad for the valves uh, tip. Um, Back in the day, it was common to, oh, this has got a little ridge on there because it's it's worn a little bit. I'm going to go over the grinder and I'm going to hit that and make it nice and smooth again. Well, yeah, you made that surface smooth, but you also ground another portion of the only heat treat that was left, and that heat treat that was left was already degraded. So it's a common failure mode where they'll grind or clean them up even with a, a sander. Um, and then what the hell, you know, it failed right, excuse my French, it failed right away um, after it went back into service. Um, other things that are obvious on the other side of the rocker would be a, a, a indication of a double radius uh, where the push rod rides. So it's actually created a new wear pattern uh, where it was designed with a single radius. So just food for thought, those uh, those slides. Um, that kind of concludes my, my presentation as our family here. Um, I appreciate uh, you listening. I do have uh, the experts here, Briars are uh form fit and surface uh, experts so if we've got any questions um uh, relative to anything that i just covered uh, we will try to answer that or we will uh do our best to answer it in writing and get it back to you so appreciate your time today awesome thank you very much dan that was a great presentation um a lot of good a uh, lot of good knowledge here Man, something that caught my ears right away right the first part of your presentation you said 600,000 push rods a week that's uh, I bet those guys are pretty tired of looking at push rods come Friday. That's a, that's a lot of push rods for sure. A um, couple questions have rolled in for sure. Um, I've got one here. Uh, this this person's asking, um, can any shop send parts to you for that cryogenic process, or is that an internal process only for you guys? No, that actually is. Uh, we're not a commercial heat trader, and we don't advertise that way. Um, but for the cryogenic treatment, we would entertain, because that is a, a very unique piece of equipment, we would entertain uh, any amount of work. Uh, I, I, I was telling you, I think, Rob, last time we talked, I, I tried my guitar strings, you know, just to see if it made mm -hmm. them sound different. It did. Yeah, it will change the properties of anything. Um, so it's, it's a black science on a lot of things. But as, as it relates to ferrous metallurgy and improving the heat treat, or the properties in steel products, um, it's a guarantee. You know, so the uh, yeah, we, we would look at that and quote that. Okay, all right. Um, another question: Can a small shop? Is there a way for a small shop to be able to check hardness on engine components, or is it pretty? Is it a pretty special procedure? So the the short answer is yes. There, you know, most small shops have at least maybe you've been exposed to what they call a Rockwell tester, or they can uh, uh, find a commercial lab that can do that for them. Um, the, that will only tell you some of the picture though. If you, you know, say you're gonna check, uh, you got a camshaft and you wanna see how hard it is. Um, if it's got wear on it, um, or if it's brand new, if you throw it on a Rockwell tester, it's gonna tell you the hardness right where you take that, you know, that diamond hit. Um, and it uh, will not tell you how deep that hardness goes into the part. Um, to, uh, the, the bad thing is to check how deep the hardness really is, is a destructive test. So you don't do it on something you're putting back into it. You're, you're destroying the part to check it. So it's made to be uh, you know, analyzed as part of building that part in the first place and making sure that the batch that came through uh, that, that process was all consistent. Okay, all right. Um, I know you kind of touched base on it near the end of the presentation, but are there any negatives to DLC coated parts? I mean, other than cost, is it, um, if, if you could have DLC, I guess, throughout the whole engine and you could afford it, is, is that the way to go? Are there any negatives there? Uh, probably not. The, uh, the biggest one is the cost, but then the second biggest would be the, uh, the design. Um, has to take into account the growth of, you know, in, in size that you get. It's just like if you chrome plate something um, and you want to have it go back into a bore or something, you got to open that bore up too. So it's not just the cost of putting that process on, it's the allowing for the uh, 
uh, the fitment of that uh, in your clearances. You know, so the uh, um, but I haven't, and again, as my knowledge base, I haven't heard anybody say DLC made this fail. <laughs> so, but okay. it is very expensive. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, another question this gentleman's asking: Can a bearing surface on a crank be too smooth? Okay, a crank. I'll I'll use the again my tribology, my territorial knowledge for because we're not crankshaft builders here, uh, but on piston pins, we do have customers that have found with certain, uh, these are diesel applications, uh, that too smooth of a piston pin uh, fails prior to a pin that's a little rougher. Um, they're, they're, uh, actually, we're actually in a study right now with a tier one customer to try to understand why, because it's, it's also in engines that have uh, what we would call limited lubrication so they're not pressurized oiling or they're more splash and things like that so we think there's a uh, that's got a major play in 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 that uh, in the reasoning behind that but uh, yeah I would uh, I would just uh, say uh, directed at the uh, the crank journal because um, that's running against a babbitt bearing and you're you're checking your clearances and everything now, that is the most important. Uh, thing is to to make sure that you've got a, a a good shape, meaning it's you know it is round, um, and that your clearance is is correct. I can't see where being too smooth would ever be a negative on that, but I would not be the expert to answer that. So I can I can definitely uh, uh, get that answered for him though, and and shoot it back to him in an email. Yeah, no problem. Um, kind of going back to the cryogenic process is. Is one more like it's uh, just trying to read the question here, but is is cryogenic more important than heat treating or is it is it is it part and parcel of heat? You know, does it should you do both or if let's say, I guess if you were could only afford to do one or the other is one more important than the other? Well, cryogenic improves the uh, the heat treating process or completes it. So it is a an extension of the heat treating process. You can do cryogenic on uh, just the base material if that design does not require heat treatment in addition to, um, you know, into, in addition to doing that cryo. You would never want to cryogenic treat a, uh, excuse me, uh, like a pin or something that is then going to success, you know, be heat treated later. Uh, you're removing any of the, uh, the change that you get. And, uh, so those changes to the core properties of the base steel uh, and of the uh, heat treated properties that cryogenically normally affects has to be the last step. You know? So the, that being said, there is a temper after cryogenic because like we talked about those stresses that are built up in any heat treatment, when you deep freeze it, you're changing the microstructure. When it changes at a molecular level, there are intrinsically uh, set stresses into that into that shape and into that material, those have to be uh, just slightly relieved with a low temperature temper. So that's a very common uh, process would be heat treat, temper, cryogenic, temper. Okay, all right. Um, another question, Dan, for you. How does the weld on a push rod affect the heat treat? Yeah, it's a good question. I didn't talk about that, but there you go. The, the engine designers have uh, allowed because uh, the resistance welding that occurs to stick that ball on the end of a heat treated tube and it's a heat treated ball uh, you melt those two metals together well, anybody at welds knows that when you you weld you are going to take the heat treatment out of the surface that you're welding because you're heating it up to the molten level of the steel uh, so when we when we uh, uh, fasten that ball to the end of the tube with the resistance welding process the tip that holds on to the ball is water cooled to keep the top half unaffected by the heat of that weld. So if you look at the uh, the microstructure, or if you even look at a hold in your hand, you will see a burn mark or a darker appearance where the ball meets the tube. That's because the weld uh, temperature was high enough to melt those two metals together, and there will not be any hardness uh, in the ball right at that juncture. Uh, but the working surface of that uh, part is the top half, the, the top 180 degrees of the ball. So on, on the drawings, they require that to be, you know, Rockwell C55 or greater, and then below that, they don't care. So. 
Okay, all right. Um, another good question here for you, Dan. Are there any technical schools that offer training in the process that you've described today? Yeah, the uh, ASM uh, is one that offers specific uh, online training uh, in, in heat treatment and all different types of uh, anything to do with metals, actually. Uh, American Society of Metals, uh, if you just go to their website, uh, you can find uh, uh, very palatable type training to get. It's not super expensive. You do it on your own pace. You can actually earn uh, CEUs if you're in school still and you want to get continuing education units uh, towards your degree. Um, those are offered uh, as, as a result of, I, I took a lot of ASM courses over the, uh, over the years uh, that uh, uh, were very beneficial in uh, um, putting tools in my toolbox uh, for, for metallurgy. So. Okay, all right. What I'm going to do, we've got one more question, just to respect everybody's time today. Uh, any questions that we didn't get to, for sure, um, you know, we'll get those over to, to Dan and the crew over at Elgin, and they'll, they'll get back to you. So, um, Dan, one more question for you. And again, this is kind of going to the small shop again, but without actually cross-sectioning a used part, could a shop etch a worn spot to see if the soft core shows through the hard case? Uh, probably not. The... Uh, uh, for one thing, the you know the etchant that makes uh, metal develop so that you can see a change in that structure is a combination of nitric acid and alcohol for most low carbon and medium carbon steel. So not, most shops are not going to have the capability to get to that. And even then, because uh, as a, as you recall, uh, when we section something destructively section it. Uh, we have to polish it down to like a mirror to really see what's going on there. So you, you might see a difference in the coloration if you squirt it with some uh, nitric, nitric acid and alcohol, but I wouldn't trust what you're seeing uh, to be any indication of what you've got to work with there. Okay. All right. So guys, I really appreciate your time today. You put a lot of work into your presentation. Um, you covered a lot of ground that we typically in industry don't get a chance to have a look at or know much about. So really appreciate the amount of effort that you put into this. And uh, any questions that we've got that uh, didn't get a chance to get to today, we'll make sure to email those to you. So uh, Dan, Breyer, Scott, I know Rick's in the background there. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate all the effort you put into this and uh, we appreciate your time. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Appreciate the uh, the platform. So. Super. Um, so what I'll do now just to wind things up, I'm going to go back over to Amanda and uh, she'll just uh, wind things down for us. All right. Thanks, Rob. Uh, real quick, all of our webinars can be found on our YouTube channel. Um, if you go to YouTube and you search Engine Builders Association or AERA Engine Builders, you will find our channel and um, this webinar will be up there probably by the end of the week and along with the one of lakes that they referenced and many others so please check that out like and subscribe our page and make sure you don't miss any future webinars and then lastly as always thank you for attending um, when you exit there will be a survey that pops up please take a moment fill that out let us know how we're doing and if you need to get a hold of anyone at AERA, you can always call us at 815-526-7600 or email either Rob or myself. You'll see both of our email addresses are listed there. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have or pass them along to the appropriate person. Thanks again for taking time out of your day. We greatly appreciate it, and we hope you have a great afternoon. You too.